Carol Bell, and uh, I am a uh, associate professor of genetics at the Tufts uh, at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at the Tufts University Veterinary School in Massachusetts. Uh, I have um, been a I was a geneticist before I went to veterinary school and became a veterinarian. So uh, as I went through veterinary school, I looked at everything with a geneticist eye in terms. Of What's going on here, and, and is there, is there a better way to try to deal with the, um, with uh, what we see in our dogs? And um, and I have done a breed health seminar such as this one for over 50 AKC breeds now. So it's very interesting uh, comparing and contrasting the different breeds and, and what we see, and, and it's it's very very interesting to me, um, especially the, um, the first half of this talk where we're going to talk about your pedigrees and your uh, background and your founders and uh, and the gene pool um, of your breed. You know, looking at it as a gene pool and not as individual dogs. And uh, and then the second half of the talk, we're going to concentrate on health and health issues and how to breed uh, healthier dogs. So um, it's a three-hour seminar total. Uh, we're going to take a, a ten-minute break. It's not going to be exactly in the middle. It's going to be somewhere about an hour, ten, hour twenty in. Where we'll take that break and then uh, and then uh, do the second half and um, and I appreciate you all uh, being here and we are making a, a tape of this um, and I guess the club is going to make uh, DVDs so that uh, you can have them as well as other people that were not able to make the specialty and uh, and uh, to make the seminar today so uh, additional background I am a uh, um, I'm an adjunct professor at Tufts. I uh, own my own small animal practice. I'm a solo practitioner, so I'm a, a own my own practice that I've had now for uh, it's actually over 25 years, and and I have an excellent reproductive veterinarian in the next town over, and so I really don't have very many uh, readers in my practice, uh, and people are surprised at that because I'm a geneticist, but I'm really a general practitioner. I do, you know, I see appointments, I do medicine cases, and I finish appointments, I go and I do surgeries, and then I finish my surgeries, I go back and see appointments again. So it's just a, a regular general practice, and all of my, virtually all of my patients are pet animals, or spay neuter pet animals. But what I do see is, is what every veterinarian sees in general practice, is what is going on with our dogs and with our pets. And, uh, and I look at it at, again genetically, so, um, so it does help me understand what is going on with America's dogs and, and what we could possibly do to improve the situation. Um, I love purebred dogs. Uh, I met my wife um, as a geneticist, and uh, she was a Gordon Setter breeder, and so I guess now I'm a Gordon Setter breeder, although I don't make any breeding decisions. Uh, but I do get to pick up poop and stuff, so it's still fun stuff to do. And, uh, um, and so, we, uh, so I really have a, a good view of, of being a veterinarian, being an owner, being a, a breeder, and uh, a whole overview of what goes on. So I, I'd like to share, share that vision with you today. So this is called a genetic overview of the Basenji. Um, also uh, can be called practical genetics for Basenji owners, uh, breeders and owners. Um, oh, I also want to thank every one of you who um, whose pictures on your websites I stole for the seminar today. So if you see any of you dogs there, just you can silently applaud, and, and I thank you for, uh, for allowing me to use them. Okay, um, I am also on the board of directors of the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, um, the OFA, that is a volunteer position, uh, and uh, the OFA is an animal health foundation dedicated to the genetic improvement of dogs. You probably know a little bit about it, about it because because one of your members, and I guess your president this year, is, is uh, works with the OFA as well, so he's probably shared some stuff with you as well. But uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about the tools that we have at the OFA that you can use to help you uh, breed uh, healthier dogs as well. And then being passed around today is a, a copy of a book that I wrote um, called Veterinary Medical Guide to Dog and Cat Breeds. It has a, a subtitle that I only share with close friends, but it, it's called Eight Years of Whatever, and uh, because that's how long it took to write it. Um, and it's, uh, it's over 700 pages, and each there's a chapter on every breed in the book. 
So, um, and what we did with the book is it has a little bit of a history of each breed, um, what the function is of the breed, uh, what the physical characteristics, uh, age, height, weight, coat, all those types of things, points of confirmation, recognized behavioral issues, and this is all coming from the veterinary literature, normal physiological variations, if, if there are some, um, drug sensitivities, if those are known, and then the inherited disorders in the breed, where we know the mode of inheritance, and, uh, um, and uh, um, in that. And, and then uh, we have disease predispositions, which we know are genetic, that, that are in increased frequency of the breed, but where we don't necessarily know a mode of inheritance of them. Uh, then isolated case studies. All of these are based on the peer-reviewed literature, and at the end of each chapter it has um, exactly the, the scientific articles where that information came from. So if, if you're a veterinarian, for example, wants to look at and, and sees a case of something and wants to know more about it, it shows them where to go for that. Uh, then what genetic tests are available in the breed, um, if there's a chick, um, uh, if it's a chick breed, what the chick requirements are for the breed, other miscellaneous information and in the references. So um, it is, uh, we've priced it so that we're not, we can't make money on the book. Um, as I said, it's over 700 pages and it goes for between 75 and 85 dollars depending on where you find it and, and what price you get. You can get it on Amazon.com. You can also get it from the, the publisher itself, which is Teton Media, and you can get it from there too. I'm not saying this so that you can go and buy, out, buy this book for yourselves, but what I find is an extremely helpful book to have as a, as a practicing veterinarian. So when I see juvenile cataracts in, in a purebred dog and wonder is this a hereditary issue in the breed, I can quickly look go to that chapter and look and see, oh look, it occurs at 12% in the breed, and it tells me a little bit about age of onset, what we know about it, inheritance or whatever. So, um, so I use it all the time in my practice, as do most of the people that I speak to that have the book. So if you're looking for a Christmas gift for your veterinarian, it might be a, a, a nice thing to give them in that regard as well. It, it helps us practice better, better veterinary medicine. Um, also, some information that we do, we do a, a breeding and genetics conference um, in Boston, uh, hosted by Tufts University and, and paid for by Purina as our major sponsor. We do that every other year. Um, the proceedings to that, um, to that conference are freely available online to everybody, and, uh, and there, there's the URL www.bin.com slash Tufts slash 2013. That is our sixth conference. It also has all the proceedings from the five prior conferences. All of the top geneticists in the world pretty much have spoken at this conference. So we've got Dr. Weary, we've got, we've got uh, um, uh, Catherine Mellish from the Animal Health Trust, you've got Oki Hedhammer from Sweden, you've got all, all the people from all over, uh, all over the world um, that have done anything in family and family genetics have spoken there. And, uh, and some wonderful literature in there. We need some uh, water as I'm speaking up here. Okay, um, we're going to do some polling and some audience participation, so I need you to use your uh, cell phones or your texting devices or, or whatever you use. If you can go to a web page, it's gonna be the easiest for you. If you just type in the web page, polleb.com slash jbell, um, this, each poll will automatically pop up and all you have to do is tap your answer or type in your answer and, uh, and um, that will come up here. If you text, um, you're going to text to the address of 22333 is the address and then you're going to text in the body of the text um, the word yodel if you love Basenjis or meow if you love Persians. Usually I have bark in there, but since it's a barkless breed, I tried to do bark with parentheses, but, but said parentheses were, were, were not allowed as characters, so I put in Yodel instead. Um, or if you know how to tweet, uh, you tweet at poll, either Yodel or meow, and, uh, and that will come up. Um, it's saying something here. Okay, so we've got uh, three people so far that have answered whether they love Basenjis or Persians which are a breed of cat. Um, <laughs> and pretty much what I'm doing is I'm getting you all, I'm getting you all onto this, uh, onto the, either the web page or, or to that uh, um, text uh, address there, because every other poll from here on in, you're just gonna go use that same page, and it'll be easier for you if we get you all on there to start with. So let's give you another uh, 
We've got nine people in so far. We'll give you another 10, 15 seconds here to see what the answers are. I want to thank John for lending me his copy of the book that he sent you, so I'll make sure I give this back to you, John, before the end of the day. Uh, it was very helpful in getting some of the history of your breed as well, which was very, very interesting. Okay, we got 12 people answered, and let's see what our answers are. And it looks like um, all of you love the Senjus and none of you love Persians. So, uh, well, maybe some of you love Persians a little, but not as much as the Senjus. Okay, so that's our first poll, and uh, now we'll, we'll move forward, but you're already oriented to the page where you need to be answering these questions. So I want to start by talking about the registration statistics of the Basenji. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, and you do it. So, and, and I'm not concentrating on any of the worldwide registrations or the Africans. We're going to uh, concentrate on the AKC registrations of the Basenji. So if we look at the bottom here, um, we've got 1985, and I'm going up by every five years through until 2005, and then I'm going with every year uh, since then. And as you can see, in 1985, um, you ranked number 60, there were 1,391 Basenjis registered with the AKC. Five years later, you went up um, to 1,619. Your rank went down by one, but that's because other breeds were moving in and also other breeds were being added and jumping ahead of you in numbers. Five years later, you still had 16,000, but 61 now, um, although your breed rank had dropped again because other more populous breeds were, were being added into the AKC registry in that regard. In 2000, you dropped about 240 dogs to 1,420, and your rank went down to 71. Not that the rank means much. Um, and then, uh, 05, you were at 982. And then each year after that, almost every year, you've gone down just a little bit in number of dogs being registered uh, for um, AKC with the Resenji breed. So you do have a breed population that is constricted, that is not growing, it is constricted. Um, over the last five years or so, all breed um, numbers have gone down just because of the economy. So uh, it, it's been more difficult to breed because, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to what the public thinks that we're just rolling in the dough making money breeding dogs, you know, we, we, we know it's expensive to breed dogs and, and we need to love doing it because we're not getting rich doing it. And, uh, um, but the breed itself, and still having 561 dogs bred, uh, um, being registered in a year is probably a little bit more than that uh, being bred, it's still a nice population. It does, uh, it does give a little bit of concern if we continue to see those numbers go down. Because it's hard, it's hard to keep a healthy, diverse population if you keep on losing part of that population, if part of that population keeps leaching out and doesn't reproduce to produce the next generation. Uh, we have uh, concerns about diversity and, uh, and the breadth of the genes that are available to the breed. Um, the litter registrations uh, are just showing the same type of pattern. I, I don't have litter registrations from 2005 to 2008, but, uh, but I do have the rest of those years in there, and it shows that, uh, you know, what you would expect. We are seeing less litters uh, being AKC registered um, over the years. So a little bit of a concern there, but still a large enough population. Uh, you're not, to, you know, there is, we have some breeds where they only have six or seven litters a year for the entire breed. And so they're really, you know, at, you know, at a teeter-totter of, of can they maintain diversity and maintain the, the health and, uh, of, of the breed. Uh, the next part of the talk is, um, it goes it, along with an article that I've written. It's probably one of the most uh, um, published articles that I've written on the, that you can see on the, on the web. It's called the Ins and Outs of Pedigree Analysis, Genetic Diversity and Genetic Disease Control. And if you just Google ins and outs of pedigree, you know, you'll see it come up like 20, 30 places on the web. One of those places is, a, is, a, um, is on an AKC website for a, a breed club, but they have it up there. But what I've done is that I, you know, in this I talk about how to look at pedigrees and breeds, but what I've done today is I've taken your pedigrees and your um, uh, uh, Basenji um, uh, computerized pedigree database and analyzed it for you. So, I think it should be very helpful to, uh, to see what's going on with your breed. 
Um, before we talk about, about your breed, though, I do need to have you uh, understand just a couple of concepts. We're not going to do a whole genetics lecture here, just a couple of concepts. Um, but, but first, we have another poll. Can we start it? No, okay, it is started. So my question to you is, my last mating was, or I preferred to do, um, inbreeding, line breeding, outbreeding, outcrossing, or crossbreeding. Now, if you're, if you're on the web page, polyb.com slash jbell, uh, the question came up, you just tap your answer. If, uh, if you are texting, then you're still texting to that 22333, and you're gonna text um, the four letter, uh, um, word there or, or symbol of, of uh, which one you use. And, and you may be confused as to what's the difference between outbreeding and outcrossing and, and so forth, but, but that's okay. We're going to talk about that next, but I just want to, to see what you guys think that you are doing with your breedings, and then we'll talk about what exactly these things mean. So we've got seven people in. We'll get above a dozen here and then see. Mine is saying this poll hasn't started yet. Mine is doing that. Um, refresh. Refresh. Okay. This is my smarter than I am. <laughs> how, how, do I, how do I refresh it? Just up top. Next to the URL, there should be a little like round arrow. With an arrow. I don't. Just, and everyone should be on the guest Wi-Fi, the through to Wi-Fi, so that way you're not getting charged okay, for timer or must messages or anything. Yeah. Okay, so we've got 14 in there, so let's see what kind of results. You can keep on answering. Okay, so the majority of you, it looks like, um, feel that you're doing line reading. Um, we've got a couple people three people that said that they do outbreeding, you've got one person that says that they do outcrossing, and no people saying they do crossbreeding or inbreeding. So let's talk about what each of those uh, different types of, of tools for breeding are. So inbreeding is breeding closely related dogs. And as a geneticist, I understand that, that the definition of inbreeding is different than what it is to a breeder. So to a breeder, inbreeding is father-daughter or full brother, full sister. It's very, very close natives. Uh, to a geneticist, inbreeding, um, there's actually something called an inbreeding coefficient, which we're going to define in the next slide. And any, any individual who has a common ancestor on both the sire and the dam's pedigree has some degree of inbreeding that uh, if they have an ancestor that appears in both the top and the bottom side of the pedigree, then there is some percent of inbreeding going on. But we recognize that you're calling inbreeding any uh, really closely bred mating. Line breeding is a less intense form of inbreeding. It concentrates the genes of a particular ancestor. So if you're saying that I'm trying to, to double up or triple up on a certain ancestor in the background, that that would be line breeding on that ancestor. Uh, outbreeding is breeding dogs less related than the average of the population. So now, now we've got a new concept, what's the average of the population? So there's an inbreeding coefficient or a percentage or a number, and we're going to tell you what that number is in your breed. Um, and it changes as, as the, the breed matures and develops, so breaking out by decades for you. But outbreeding is breeding two dogs that are less related than the average mating in the population and line breeding would be breeding two dogs together that are, are more related than the average mating in the population. Um, outcrossing is what you guys call outbreeding. Okay, so you're saying I have an outcrossed litter, what you're saying is that you have an outbred litter. Um, as geneticists, we like to reserve the word cross for when you're actually taking two individuals from two different breeds and breeding them together, which is what crossbreeding is. And when I first started doing this, these lectures, I would say, and nobody does crossbreeding, but then designer bred breeds came along and now a lot of people are doing crossbreeding because, because they think it's gonna make a healthier dog, which is completely fallacious, and we'll talk about that as well. But uh, that's crossbreeding, bringing two um, different breeds together. So, so really, what we have is we have three different populations of dogs that are out in the world. 
we have our purebred dogs, and there's a nice percentage. Uh, we have our designer bred dogs, or uh, um, dogs that are bred across uh, between two breeds, and, and there's the actual, actual, you know, probably the, the grandfather of all designer bred dogs is a Kapapu, because uh, that's been going on for much longer than many of the other designer breeds. And then you've got your random bred dog. But when I look at these three populations, what I look at actually is two populations. Um, what I see is purposefully bred dogs, which are the purebreds and the designer breds, where a human decides who's breeding to who, and then I see a other population, the random bred population, where a human had no input into who got bred to who, it was totally up to the dogs. Okay, so, um, so what I see as a veterinarian and as someone that's trying to improve the health of dogs, if you're doing purposeful mating, where a human is deciding who breeds to who, then there is some responsibility there to try to ensure that we're doing our best to produce healthy dogs. And there are lots of things that we can do to assist with that uh, concept. Okay, so here's a, a cartoon, Get Fuzzy, one of my favorite cartoons. And the guy says, ever hear the expression familiarity breeds contempt? And the dog sits there and thinks for a bit, and he says, no, in the dog world, we say familiarity breeds hip dysplasia. <laughs> And this is the general population's um, concept of breeding, that, that purebred dogs or dogs, because they're related to each other in their background, are going to be unhealthy and have diseases, that inbreeding or line breeding actually causes disease, when we know that that absolutely is not the case of what happens. Deleterious genes and disease-related disease uh, genes are what cause disease, uh, not the way that you breed dogs. And so we'll be talking about that today. Okay, so a couple of uh, concepts I need to understand to go through the Basenji data. The first is the inbreeding coefficient, um, also called the rights coefficient. So I'm going to read to you the definition, and then I'm going to break down that definition so that we understand it. So the definition is the proportion of all variable gene pairs that are likely to be homozygous due to inheritance from ancestors common to the sire and dam. So what does this mean? The proportion, and, and so it's a percentage. So, so if we say an inbreeding coefficient is 17%, then that's the proportion that we're talking about is 17% um, of all variable gene pairs. So what does that mean? Well, the genes that make a dog a dog do not vary. Okay, so you breed a dog to a dog, you don't get a chicken. All right, so those are non-variable gene pairs. And then the genes that make a Basenji a Basenji are non-variable. So you breed two Basenjis, you don't get a litter of chihuahuas, right? So those are non-variable gene pairs. So when we're talking about an inbreeding coefficient, all we're talking about are the gene pairs that vary within your breed. What percentage of the variable gene pairs are being affected are likely to be homozygous, homo being same, heterozygous being meaning different. So homozygous, we know that all genes come in pairs and you get one of the pair from the sire and the opposite of the pair from the dam. And it can be little a, little a, or it can be a big A, big A. It doesn't matter whether they're dominant or recessive or what types of genes they are. It's just whether they're gonna be the same gene or they're gonna be different genes in that pair. So homozygous means that they're gonna be the same gene in a gene pair. Um, due to inheritance from ancestors common to the sire and dam, meaning, that if you have little a and little a, that it's a good chance that it came from an ancestor in the background, cast on that little a from to the top side, through the, through the sire side of the pedigree, as well as that ancestor being on the dam side and passing it up through the dam side of the pedigree and causing homozygosity. So, so if you say an inbreeding coefficient of 17%, we expect 17% of all of the variable gene pairs to be homozygous due to inheritance from common ancestors in the background. Another, and so we're talking about the, the total of all the gene, of the variable gene pairs in the dog. Another way of looking at that inbreeding coefficient is it can tell us the probability of an individual being homozygous at any given gene pair. What's the chance that any single gene pair is going to be homozygous due to common ancestry? 17%. So we can look at it in terms of the proportion of all the gene pairs or the likelihood of any single gene pair being homozygous. Okay. And then the last thing I need you to understand, the other concept is the relationship coefficient. 
And that is a measurement of the probable genetic likeness between the individual and a particular ancestor. So when you're saying you're line reading, um, line reading on who? Okay, so if you're trying to concentrate the genes of a particular ancestor, that is line reading. And you get, a, again, a percentage, and that's the probable percentage of genes the individual and the ancestor have common from descent. So that, that is the percentage uh, that expect to be passed down through the pedigree. And the relationship coefficient has a, has a complicated uh, um, formula for it, but we can approximate it by using the, what's called the percent blood calculation. And percent blood just gives us a, a certain percentage based on what position of the pedigree that individual appears on. So we know the sire and the dam pass on 50% of the genes. We know each grandparent passes on 25% of the genes. And each great-grandparent passes on 12 and a half. So if you have an individual that's a grandparent on one side at 25% and a great-grandparent on the bottom side at 12 and a half, then we know that the relationship coefficient of the individual with that pedigree um, to that ancestor is going to be 37.5% based on that calculation. And, uh, and that's going to be a pretty accurate. It's average. It could be more. It could be less. But that's a pretty accurate representation um, of the pedigree. OK. So let's start looking at some of your, your pedigrees. No, nope, not yet, sorry. Um, so this, this is a really interesting, uh, you know, this took about two weeks to, to work on here for me. So what this is, it is all of the pedigrees in this computerized database, um, the Senji database that went all the way back that was anonymously uh, um, passed on to me so I can do the analysis for you. So you've got dogs in there from the 1930s, with birth, and there are dogs without birthdays that preceded these, um, but, but for the dogs that had the birthdays, where there actually was the vast, vast majority, about 80, 85 to 90 percent of the dogs in this database had birthdays, which is pretty amazing. You know, usually I've got like a third of the dogs without birthdays, and who knows what decade they actually belong to. So you got the 1930s here. The mean number of generations in terms of ancestors in the pedigree was 6.3. So it's an early time in your breed. It's only six generations on average for the dogs in that period. Um, the mean number of unique ancestors was, was 33.4. So if an ancestor appears more than once, it's still only counted once as a unique ancestor in this decade. And the mean uh, inbreeding coefficient was 7.4%. And I look at a uh, what I call a mean all generation in coefficient that, that, that takes all relatives going all the way back. And then I also look at a 10 generation in breeding coefficient, um, which is what we standardly look at. Um, and uh, you'll see why, why we look at that as well. But because the average was only 6.3 generations, uh, the difference between a 10 generation and all generations, they're going to be the same because it just doesn't go 10 generations. In the 1940s, you now have 11.5 generations on average. Um, you have 67.5 unique ancestors in these pedigrees, um, and you've got a breeding coefficient of 15.7%. In the 1950s, you get more generations, you get more ancestors, your breeding coefficients go up even further. In the 60s, you're up to 24%, uh, and, uh, and you've got 210, uh, 211 unique ancestors, and you're going 22.9 generations back in those pedigrees. And now you're starting to see a little bit of a difference between the truncated just 10 generations where we compute that immediate coefficient versus using every generation that goes back um, so where, uh, where it's going to have a higher coefficient. But if you think about it, and if a father-daughter or full brother, full sister mating, the immediate coefficient just from that relationship is 25%. Okay, that's inbreeding. And that's what most of us will say we will never do. But already at this point, the average inbreeding coefficient of the Basenji is, is around 25%. And if you look at any breed, it's going to be fairly high like that. It's going to, you're going to have a really high number. So it's not the number that has anything to do with the health of the breed. Um, it, it, it really is just the background of the breed. And this is what we see with every single breed that I analyzed, that, that you know, you have a small population, they have to be related to each other because there aren't a lot of dogs to breed to, and as that population grows and expands, your ability in the next generation to select a mate that's less related than the mates in the prior generation, you have more choices, and, and that those numbers, um, relatively speaking, will start to go down. And that's what that 10 generation coefficient is, is telling us. 
If we're seeing this number start to go down here, that means when only looking at 10 generations, the last 10 generations, you're able to breed dogs together that were less related than the prior generation. And that, that tells you that you're using the breadth of your gene pool in, in doing your mating, so you're not focusing on a single line of dogs. And it's not just small breeds that have that issue um, with a popular sire syndrome, or which we'll talk about, or, or, or dealing with, with popular lines. Uh, we see this in very, very populous breeds. We see it in poodles, we see it in Bichons, where, where the average 10 generation coefficient keeps going up and up and up because everyone's breeding to a certain dog, and then that dog gets replaced by its son, and then that son gets replaced by its son, or, or relatives of those, and everyone, instead of using the breadth of their gene pool, is truncating on a single family line, and you're losing diversity in your background. So what we're seeing here is that your breeding coefficients over 10 generations whoops, are going down, and, uh, and so you're utilizing the breadth of your, of your pedigrees while the background is still going to be going up. You don't lose, when we do a 10 generation, the dogs that were related to each other in the 11th and 12th generations aren't counted anymore. So, so those numbers are, go, are not literally going down if you look at all of the generations, but relatively speaking, they're going down based on 10 generations. What you have that's unique is that you had dogs being brought back from Africa and brought into your gene pool and incorporated very well into your gene pools to provide more diversity and background. And that's the biggest reason your numbers went from the 70s at almost 25% to, in this decade, 7.4%. That's a startling, startling statistic um, based on a 10 generation pedigree of what you've been able to do with, with the imports. And in reality, are these totally accurate? No, they're not, because, because it's obvious your Basenjis from the 60s and earlier came from the same stock that the Basenjis that you're bringing from Africa came from. We just don't know the pedigree background of those of those tribal Basenjis and, and African Basenjis, so we're calling them new founders while they still have the same background as your breed. But still, it's bringing in a depth of background um, that, uh, that you did not have. Um, and the number of ancestors that are there. So when we graph this out, um, here is the mean, red is the mean of all generation and breeding coefficients, and that number is starting to go down too as well because you now have new founders that are in there, but they are being overwhelmed by all of the other dogs in the backgrounds that, that, that far outnumber them. So those numbers still stay up. They're not gonna drop down like this, they'll still stay up, but they are going down slightly because new founders are coming in that don't have the pedigree background. Um, and then you here is your 10 generation of breeding coefficient that starts to go down in the 70s and, and so forth because of the um, judicious use of those uh, African dogs. So I'm really uh, excited about looking at what you've done here because we see this to different extents in other breeds where they where the American breeders start incorporating European and, and other you know and other. Uh, um, uh, kennel club dogs into their, into their gene pools to try to increase diversity and it does help somewhat, but you've really done uh, um, a, a, a big job with those African uh, dogs and, and it's really startling what we see here for the, the differences here. Okay, when we look at other breeds, and most of these breeds I'm looking at the 1990s to tell us what their average um, averages are just to, to use good comparisons, and, uh, but some of them, because they don't have a lot of numbers in, in their, in their um, pedigrees, uh, in their, their pedigree databases, I've had to, to use larger or smaller sizes so I can statistically compare them. And that's just my, my retentiveness because I need these to be statistically significant. Um, but what you're looking at here, the average 10 generation of breeding coefficients um, of, some breed, of most breeds is going to be somewhere in the teens. Um, you've got some breeds that really lack diversity, the Norfolk Terrier, the Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retriever, the Scottish Deerhound, um, even the Bull Terrier a little bit, um, the, uh, um, and the surprise, the Bichon Frise, which is a very populous breed, you think there's no way that they're going to lack diversity, but they have a huge popular sire effect and familial effect that, they, that they've dealt with um, that, that's caused their 10 gener um, generation coefficients to continue to go up. 
And then you see look, some of your diverse breeds, the Samoyed is less than 10%, you've got the German short-haired pointer, you've got your Mastiff breed, and some people think Mastiffs because they have some some health issues that, that are that a lot of people know about think, think it's because of inbreeding that they must lack diversity. It's got nothing to do with diversity. Um, you've got your uh, uh, let me see, you've got and your cavalier is the same thing. People think, oh my god, they're so inbred, they're having problems. They, that's a fairly outbred population there compared to other breeds with your cavaliers, um, your Bouvier, your Borzoi, and so forth. Uh, and your Bernese Mountain Dog as well, and your Cocker Spaniel. Um, so if you look at the 1990s in the, um, the Sanji, your average 10 generation was 15.6. So you're sitting right smack in the middle with everybody else having a, an average diversity in your background. And then you go from the 90s to 2000s at 11%, and 2010 to 7.4%. Um, those, those, you're now at the most diverse breeds um, based on comparison to other breeds there. Again, a little, a little false number because we don't have the backgrounds of those African dogs to tie them back to your, your dogs ancestrally, but certainly uh, based on what you're able to bring in and work with, um, it has lowered your numbers. Okay, now let's look at some of your pedigrees. So I've selected a couple of dogs and I had help from, uh, with some of your readers to try to select some of these uh, so that maybe they would be dogs that you would recognize. So this is a dog called, um, and I'm going to mess up your names horribly, but maybe not as bad as I mess up the French breeds that I try to collect them to. Uh, but Aquavis Tornado, did I say that right? And what is his call name? What is it? Nate. Nate? Okay. So he was born in 1989. Um, he... Uh, had 253 offspring in the database, so he certainly was a, a prolific dog. And if we look at three generations of his pedigree, um, we don't see any common ancestors within three generations. Um, if uh, we do look at his 10 generation in breeding coefficient, it's 15.1%. And for the 19, he was 1989. So 21.6 was the average in the 80s, but in the 90s it was 15.6. And he was born on the cusp. So, so he's still probably um, a little outbred compared to his, his uh, um, uh, average breedings during his, uh, um, his uh, decade or his generation. Uh, if we look at his all generation coefficient, it's exactly 25.0%. So we expect 25% of his variable gene pairs to be homozygous due to common ancestry, even though we don't see those in the first three generations. When we do a, a pedigree analysis of him, this is what we're looking at. And this is looking at all generations. So the most influential dog in Nate's pedigree is Kinga of the Congo, who contribute, contributed over a third of his genes to Nate. Uh, Kinga was born in 1939. He had 95 offspring. He doesn't appear until the, first, until the 11th generation of Nate's pedigree but he is the most influential dog in Nate's pedigree, contributing a third of his genes. And he occurs six, over 62,000, well, 62,001 times in Nate's pedigree, okay? Um, the next most uh, influential dog in Nate's pedigree is Kwanga of the Congo. Oh, and by the way, Nate, um, Kinga is from a father-daughter mating, okay? And his father, was Kwango, is Kwango of the Congo, um, who, because it's Kinga's father, first appears in the 12th generation. Um, he contributes over a quarter of the genes, so more than any grandparent. Uh, he appears over 132,000 times in Nate's pedigree. The next most influential ancestor is Reveal Recruit. Reveal? Yeah, I figured it was going to be something like that. Reveal <laughs> Recruit. Um, and, and this individual appears for the first time in the sixth generation. So this is actually an individual that is line bred into the pedigree. Kinga and Kwango are what I call background inbreeding. Okay, this is the background of your breed. They're going to be in everyone's pedigree. They're going to be in high numbers. And, and their percentages are going to be approximately the same in every single pedigree. 
because that is what your breed is. Okay. Uh, whereas Reveille Recruit is actually a line bred individual, appears almost as much, uh, contributes almost as much as any grandparent. Um, first appears in the sixth generation, appears 54 times. Um, he was uh, born in 1960. Uh, then we've got Kaja's Gay Flambeau of Edjoy, who first appears in the fifth generation, 22.9%, uh, appears 23 times, um, was born in 1967. And then we move down to Kingolo, uh, who was in the ninth generation, over 3,000 times. Uh, Brown Trout of the Congo in the tenth generation, 14,000 times. Uh, and you move down the list and you see a lot more of the background. And then Shadowby's general business first appears in the third generation. It's actually appeared in that pedigree that I showed of Nate, um, but only appears two times. So third generation, you know, was 12.5%. So the difference between that is going to be uh, 3.1%, and 3.1 is, so it's 12.5 and a half is 6.25, and 3.1 and 3 is half of that, so it's gonna be a great, great grandparent on the opposite side um, of the pedigree. Um, um, Amatanazig, Amatanazig? Zig. Zig. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zig appears for the first time in the 12th generation, um, I don't have a birthday for her, it's a female. Um, she appears over 37,000 times um, in the uh, pedigree, and she is one of your founders, uh, one of the founders of the breed, and we'll talk about founders uh, as we move along here. Um, and then several more here, and then Reveille Reup um, in the fifth generation um, uh, appeared seven times. So this is really the background of Nate, uh, of his breeding. And uh, so some of these are not going to be in every pedigree. You are close, your individuals in the fifth and sixth and, uh, generations. And the rest of these are going to be in every single pedigree because it's the background and reading of the breed. OK, now let's look at another dog. This is Jasuri Sukari, the illustrated man. Anybody recognize him? Yes. OK, he was born in 1999. What's his call name? Timmy. Timmy. What? Timmy. Timmy? Timmy. 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 T or K? T. T. T is in tin. Okay. Like, like a lassie. Yes. Okay. All right. Timmy had uh, 59 offspring in the, um, in the uh, database. And if you look at, when I look at pedigrees that have common ancestors, I take out my colored flares and I, I color them in so that it gives me a good, good uh, visual as to how they're related. So what we find is that Sukari spot the target is, a, is the paternal grandsire as well as being the maternal grandsire. Okay, so, so if we, if, so Jasiri uh, Sukari Jury Seinfeld and Jasiri Sukari Taboo, if we thought of these as people, how would they be related? What would we call the relationship between the two half of them? Half brother and sister. It's a half brother, half sister. So this is a half brother, half sister mating, okay? Due to the common ancestry of Sukari spot the target. Um, the 10 generation breeding coefficient of, uh, of Timmy is 24.0%. But we know that just based on the half brother, half sister mating, 12.5% comes just from that relationship alone. So half of that, a little over half that, that embryo coefficient is purely due to that half brother, half sister mating. And the all generation embryo coefficient is 35.9%, so well over a third. So this, is, this, is, this would be considered a, a line bred dog. Um, and, and a 10 generation coefficient of 24% in the 1990s um, average was 15.6, so certainly more tightly bred than, uh, than the rest of his generation. So we also, as geneticists, will do what are called arrow diagrams. And this is an arrow diagram of that half-brother, half-sister relationship. But we don't repeat um, the, the common individual. We just, we just draw arrows to them. And you see this diamond shape showing a half-brother, half-sister relationship. Um, and just based on the relationship, we know that it's 12 and a half percent. And we know that the relationship coefficient of that common grandparent is going to be about 50 percent. 25 percent is a grandsire from the top. 25% as a grandsire from the bottom. Um, and so really 50% is the same as from either parent. But when you have a line bred individual, what we talk about is the fact that that individual is gonna be more influential than a parent. 
because appearance only passes on its genes from one side of the pedigree. Um, and its genes are going to be paired up with genes from other individuals that can mask or alter the expression of those genes. Whereas a common ancestor can pass down its genes from both sides of the pedigree and pair them and match them back up again and therefore uh, be more representative of that individual to pass on their genes um, in the next generation. So, so percentages from common ancestors um, compared to individuals that just appear once in the pedigree that have a similar number are going to be less influential than the common ancestor. And, uh, and in that article that's online, um, it shows you what the percentages are for the different types of common uh, matings that, that can be done. Uncle, niece, half-brother, half-sister, father, granddaughter are all 12.5%. Um, first cousin mating is 6.25%. Uh, and then what the relation, the percent blood relationship to the common ancestor is going to be um, based on those different types of matings. Okay, so looking at Timmy's pedigree, um, no surprise that Sukari spot the, the target is a uh, the most influential ancestor at 50%. First appears as a grandparent, appears two times in the pedigree. Pendragon sugar babe of, of Kazor, Kazor um, uh, contributes 32.8%. Uh, first appears as a great grandparent, appears five times in the pedigree. Kinga of the Congo, once again, we now go back to our backgrounds, 32.2, uh, um, about a third, which is what we saw in the past, 820,000 times. Kwango, 25%, over 1.7 1, 1. million times in the pedigree. The numbers are higher because this individual, because uh, Timmy was born in 1999 versus Tornado, versus Nate in 1989. So it's so a more recent, the pedigree, the bigger these numbers of the millions of, of times they show up is going to be. But you'll notice the percentages are still about the same because that's what the background of your breed is. No one's going to get away from having a third Kinga and, and a quarter Kanga uh, go. That's just what your breed is. That's the basis of your breed. Uh, Kingolo at 43,000, uh, 23.4. Then you've got a little bit more of your you know, more recent uh, purposeful line reading. Uh, Reveille Re-Up, um, 85 times starting in the fifth. Reveille Recruit, uh, 542 times starting in the sixth. And just, uh, just series to carry, just because, um, three times, uh, I'm sorry, twice the pedigree, um, starting in the third generation, and so forth down the line. Um, Bereke of Bleen um, is a female. I don't have her birthday. She had 10 offspring. Um, she appears to over 2.2 million times in the pedigree, um, contributing uh, significantly more than any great grandparents. Okay, the next one I've got here is El Dorado's um, Akuaba one more time. And this is a male born in 2008. And his call name is? What? Smoky. Smoky? I've got 49 offspring in the database, and, um, and he doesn't have any common ancestors in the first three generations, and in actuality, oh no, I'm sorry, he, he does. He has uh, um, Akwapa's um, busy body from Kissa, actually appears not multiple times in the third, but appears in the fourth generation. And then, and then you've got Nate up here in the third generation, um, but then appearing behind uh, an individual in the, th uh, in the third ge generation. Also appears behind Busybody from K um, Kissa, and therefore appears in the fifth generation there as well. So you do have some commonality there. But still, the 10 generation of reading coefficient for Smokey is 8.8%. And uh, for a dog born in 2008, um, the average is 7.4%. He's not much different than the average for his generation at 8.8. .8. His all generation coefficient is 17.9%. And so if you look at his pedigree um, analysis, uh, Nate is the most influential dog at 281 
appears three, uh, four times, starting the third generation. You've got Kinga of the Congo. Now you got a little bit less there uh, for him, and there's a reason for that we'll talk about in a second, but he was down to 26% at, at, at almost 2.5 million appearances. Congo at a little over 20%, um, starting the 14th generation. And if you figure out what one appearing once in the 14th generation is, it's like 0.001, you know, percent. So it really adds up, but appearing over 5.3 million times in the pedigree. Um, and then there's Aquaba Byzantine from Kissa at 18.8%. So some of the more recent breeding, and then some of your background breeding, again, as you move down the line. So, so this one, those percentages from Kinga and Pongo are a little bit less, and there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that. Okay, and the last pedigree I want to look at is uh, Zendika's Johnny Come Greatly, and he is a male that was born in 1995. Uh, his call name? Johnny. Johnny. Finally an easy one <laughs> to, to figure out. I'm still thinking about Smokey with one more time. There's got to be something there. Right? I don't know. Okay, um, and, uh, and he has 50 offspring in the database. And, and what we have with Johnny is a Changa's Gala celebration is a double great-grandparent. Okay, so we have 12.5% uh, from the top and 12.5% from the bottom. So the relationship for him is gonna be 25%. Um, his inbreeding coefficient is 12. Uh, his 10 generation inbreeding coefficient is 12.5%. So in actuality, in 10 generations, uh, the inbreeding, well actually a great grandparent, common great grandparent is 6.25. So half his inbreeding coefficient is still from that relationship, but still a, a low coefficient. And for his generation of 95, 15.6%, he is out, even though he's a double great grandparent, made it. Um, he, his embryo coefficient is less than the, he's outbred for his generation. Um, and his all generation embryo coefficient is 26%. And there is a reason for that, even though he, it looks like there's some type reading going on here. So here's the arrow diagram showing a couple of generations before he ties together. And here is his uh, um, embryo coefficient, his uh, um, pedigree analysis. Uh, can go back up to a third. Uh, 321,000, Pongo at 26.3, um, and then you've got uh, Chango's Gala Celebration at the 25%. Uh, you've got uh, some uh, more recent line reading, Chantera's Genta Snow Flurry, and, uh, and Chango's Real Legend, and then you've got your other background reading that, uh, um, that we've seen all along um, with, uh, with everybody else here. So those are four um, pedigrees, and then I want you to take a look at the reason why we need to look at the same number of generations when we compare one pedigree to the other. Why do we use 10 generations all the time? Why don't we just use whatever we have? So here are the four, um, the four dogs that we just looked at their pedigrees, and here are their inbreeding coefficients based on only a certain number of generations, calculating it based on a certain number of generations. And what it shows us is that just based on two generations, the only individual that has an inbreeding coefficient, uh, a calculatory coefficient, is, um, is Timmy, who had the half-brother, half-sister mating, and it gave us that 12.5, okay? The, uh, and actually, the, the common great-grandparents, yeah, I made a mistake, it's, it's a <coughs> grandparent would be, would be 6.25, a common great-grandparent, um, for Johnny, gives us the 3.1 in three generations there. Um, you've got the multiple ancestors with, uh, with Nate and so forth uh, that show up in, uh, in Smokey's pedigree that starts him off up here, and then don't move much until it gets down to the eighth generation or so and start to move back up a little bit more. Um, and then with uh, Nate's pedigree, you see it going up here. So if you compare an eight generation immune coefficient for one dog, to a five generation another, to a 12 generation another, you're not really comparing apples to apples. You need to look at the same number of generations if you're gonna compare their pedigrees and say, is this one more tightly bred or less tightly bred than the other dog? So that tells you a little bit about the background um, of your breed and the background ancestors of your breed. Now the next analysis that I did, which was really cool, 
which I don't do for every breed because a lot of databases don't just don't go back all the way. And this database did, which made it really exciting for me. Um, and then plus the new founders made it really exciting as well. So let's look at who the founders are of these four dogs in their background. And so here are, um, here are the founders of your breed. And here's Nate and, uh, and Timmy and Smokey and Johnny. And what you're going to, and I've colored them in based on more than 5%, uh, you know, between five, you know, uh, more than two, but less than 5%, or clear if they're 2% if they're or less. And what you find with everybody is that they're all, uh, that, that Zig, Kindo, and Kasemi are the major founders of your breed. Those are the three dogs that, that contribute the most to everyone in your breed. And they're all going to be up, you know, in, in similar numbers here if there are not other new founders coming in lowering their percentages. Everybody's going to have about 2% or a little less than 2% of Wow, Mungwa, Kensu, Nagashi, and Tango. Okay, this is, this is the ancestral background of your breed. And these percentages are going to be common across just about everybody. But, and I know that there are other dogs than the AB dogs that, that, that are modern founders that have been brought from Africa, but I looked at those with, with a couple of different dogs. And so when you look at Smokey, you then add AB Gangura at 3.9%, uh, AB Nagola at 3.1%, AB Zami, AB Diagba, and AB Mablinki um, at these percentages here, and you see some of the new blood, the new founders coming in. And so the reason why all of a sudden um, Kinga and Quango's numbers dropped in Smokey's pedigree is because he had new founders that did not trace back to them. Now probably those founders did, and those numbers would have been a quarter and a third, like we would have expected, but because there are no pedigrees on, on those new founders, those percentages did drop some um, in what we're looking at. And then in Johnny's pedigree, he's got AB uh, Gangura at 1.6%, so starting to affect his pedigree there. But these guys are, are more of the mainstream, so I wanted to look at a couple of dogs that have much greater influence from, from some of the modern African founders. And so I took three dogs here, um, New World, Heart Like a Wheel. And so you see a little bit less of the contribution of, of the, what we expect from Zig and Kintu and Kasemi, but you've got 12.5% from AB uh, Diaba. Okay, you look at um, Akuaba in Corduroy 1997, he's got 12 and a half from AB Gangura. And you look at um, Kabushi Hot Ticket, he's got 12 and a half percent from AB Nagandi and 6.2% from AB Zami. And so, just as an example, of how the modern founders are, are inching their way into the backgrounds of your dogs and bringing down those percentages um, of your inbreeding coefficients. So not necessarily completely true because they do have common backgrounds to your other dogs, but, um, but certainly bringing those numbers down because they are new blood that's now coming into the American background. Okay, so up this portion, I want to talk a little bit more generally about genetic diversity because genetic diversity is now a big buzzword in dog breeding about you know how we maintain diversity and, and it's really important, but it is so misconstrued as to what actually represents genetic diversity, what it is, what we need to do about it, what we don't need to do about it, um, because because actually some breeds are hurting themselves thinking that they're they're helping themselves by increasing diversity. And, and one of the reasons for that is that um, in classical pop animal population genetics, um, indices have been developed to show the relatedness of, of individuals and populations. And all of those computations came about um, from, the, uh, uh, from dealing with endangered species and mostly coming from zoo animals um, and endangered species. And where all of these indices that they calculate um, Thing that has a relationship to each other is considered bad. Okay, so, so your numbers go down if there's any kind of relationship between one individual to the next because they're looking for a completely randomized outbred population. And that's completely different from what we do in dog breeding. 
We're looking for selective breeding. We're looking to concentrate traits and concentrate genes. And so the indices that you look at for a species um, survival plan versus what we're looking for in dogs are completely different. But unfortunately, conservation geneticists are being brought into the canine genetics world to talk to us and say, how can we increase our diversity? And all they're telling us to do is outbreed, outbreed, outbreed. And that's not what's the best thing for our breeds. Um, let's talk about what line breeding versus outbreeding does, because these are tools that we use, and they're very helpful tools. But we have to recognize that they're tools, and they're not goals. The goal is not to create the lowest inbreeding coefficient that you can in your, in your breedings. Um, but you use these for tools. Line breeding increases homozygosity. It exposes deleterious recessive genes through homozygosity. So if you've got deleterious recessive genes in the background and you're, and you're increasing the numbers of, of genes that are getting paired up, you can see them expressed more. It does not create those deleterious genes. They're already there in the background. Um, and it attempts to create predictability and reproducibility in the offspring. Although when we actually look at dog breeding, what we find that creates the most reproducibility and predictability is actually dominant genes. When we see a male that is prepotent, which means that he passes on his top line or his length of forearm or, or, or whatever characteristic you see in that dog to his offspring, regardless of what bitch is brought to him, regardless of the pedigree background of, of that bitch, prepotent males, it's because he's probably homozygous for some dominant traits that he just continually throws regardless of what he produces. And so, so actually it's dominance that tends to produce more of our reproducibility and predictability in that regard. Outbreeding decreases homozygosity and increases heterozygosity. It's breeding um, individuals that are less, um, less related than the average. It tends to prevent recessively affected individuals by masking um, recessive genes through heterozygosity. It does not eliminate those recessive genes. It actually multiplies them in the carrier state. Um, due to heterozygosity. It tends to bring in novel genes, and that's the reason you outbreed. Okay, you're outbreeding because there's something somebody has that you don't have, and you want to bring it in. And that's why you outbreed. That's why you go out to get something that you want, that you don't have. Okay? Um, so you're wanting to bring in novel genes. Um, and the, the classical line is that it tends to produce more variability in litters, but Without crossbreeding or complete inbreeding, the differences in, in, in the variability in litters does not correlate to your inbreeding coefficient of that litter. Okay, if you're talking the difference between an 8% and an 18%, um, your variation is still going to be based on dominant genes um, and, and expression of some recessives in there. So, so the number doesn't correlate to your variability in that. So those are the, the differences between line breeding and outbreeding. So as I said, some conservation geneticists and some international registries in response to perceived concern with genetic diversity are saying that we should be all be doing outbreeding to those least related. And some registries in Europe especially, they have banned post mating. So you can't register a father daughter or a full brother full sister mating. And for the, for the most of us, does that make a big difference? No, because most of us don't do that anyway. But but it's really window dressing. It's not addressing at all diversity. Um, all it's, it's doing is playing into the public perception of inbreeding and that they're doing something about it by banning those matings. But it is selection and not the types of matings that affect breed diversity. And I can go on another 20 minutes and show you examples as to why the different types of matings have nothing to do with changing the frequencies of genes in the population. But, but trust me, they don't. It's who you're breeding to produce the next generation that affects the diversity of your population. Uh, most breeds, less than 5% of the breed, and in many breeds, less than 2% of the breed ever reproduces to produce the next generation. So there's a huge probability, possibility or probability of huge shifts in the gene pool just based on who gets bred and who doesn't get bred. And that's why if you have decreasing population numbers over the years, um, just who gets bred and who doesn't get, get bred, all of a sudden three or four more of those aren't getting, 
aren't getting bread is you're losing that as well, and that's what affects diversity the most. So in the, the, eighth, um, the uh, KC in the uh, UK, um, they have this new mate selection program where you can go online and look up and find the least related dog to breed to your dog, so they're looking for you to outbreed. And even in the United States, uh, Mars is offering something called optimal selection, and it's looking at uh, chromosome segments of dogs, and they're going to say, you know, we'll look at many different dogs and pick for you the best dog for you to breed to that's the least related based on minor allele frequencies in the chromosomes. And what that's actually looking at is they'll look at a whole breed and they'll say this chromosomal segment is only appearing 17% of the time in your breed, whereas that chromosomal segment is at 40% in other breeds. And therefore, you should breed to the dogs that have that minor allele frequency, that minor segment frequency, and bring that frequency up to increase the diversity in your breed. Not even knowing what genes lie on that piece of chromosome. Okay? So in, all, in reality, you guys have, could be, have been selecting for decades to get that thing down to 17%. Like, you know, you know, we finally got, we don't see that damn thing anymore that we used to see all the time. And now they're telling you you want to you breed to that without knowing at all what it relates to. Selection, selection, selection. That is what breeding is about. And that's what we need to do. It's not based on a number. It's not based on a concept or a tool. It's based on breeding the best quality dogs that we can find and that we can work with. So recommendations to only outbreed. What else does it do that's detrimental? It homogenizes breeds. If I need to breed to the least related one in this generation, then all of a sudden I'm related to that. Okay, so now I gotta find something not related to this or that, and I'm over here now. So I now agree to that, and now I'm related to that too. <laughs> so now, now I gotta agree to something else unrelated. What you're doing is you're homogenizing the breed. You're gonna make everybody the same, and no one's gonna be different. And how, how are you gonna so get selection if you don't have differences between dogs and between lines? It's gonna ruin dog breeding and our ability to, to, to actually make a difference with our breedings. Gene pool diversity requires distinct lines in order to create selective pressure. So none of the types of mating systems, inbreeding, line breeding, or outbreeding change the frequency of defective genes or their dissemination. It's got nothing to do with it. Okay, so the whole thing about inbreeding, disease, and outbreeding, you know, happy, healthy dogs, or whatever, that's used in a different way. But anyway, it's, it's got nothing to do with it. Um, it is selection, and it is that alters diversity. And the number one thing that alters genetic diversity and decreases, diminishes genetic diversity that we see in our dog breeds is the popular sire syndrome. That, that's definitely something we can put our finger on that says this diminishes diversity. And what that syndrome is, this is a, um, a pedigree map of, that a geneticist uses. So, so what we look at, squares are males, circles are females, um, horizontal lines are matings, vertical lines are offspring. Okay, and so, so this is a diverse um, gene pool here. Okay, it's a little bitty gene pool, but it's, it's diverse. It's got, it's got some lines that are unique. It's got some lines that are all mixed together. But everybody's in the mix there. And then you get this male that comes along, and everybody oohs and ahs. And he's, you know, he's phenomenal. He's wonderful. He wins. And everybody wants to breed to him. So right away, everybody's breeding to this male, and they're loving what they're seeing out of him, and they're really happy, and then they start line breeding on this male, and, and very rapidly, within just a few generations, his genes are spread across the entire gene pool. And it's only after a couple generations that you actually start to see what recessives he carries and what he actually is passing on to the breed. And maybe good, maybe not good, but you don't know about it until after it all happens. And, and that's, that's one of the biggest issues with the, found, with the uh, popular sire effect is the founder's effect, passing on one dog, passing on his particular recessive genes to the entire gene pool as it gets spread very quickly. And you might say, now come on, Dr. Bell. You know, uh, you know you've got Kinga, you've got Quango, you've got Nate, you know, you've got dogs that are back there that appear hundreds of times in the pedigree, just like it appears hundreds of times, you know, this popular sire appears hundreds of times, and so what's the difference? 
Well, the difference is they were the, they got those numbers because they produced quality, who were then selected for breeding to produce quality, who were then selected for breeding to produce quality over dozens of generations to give them those numbers. Whereas the popular sires are just being bred because they're popular sires, based on what they have, not necessarily what they've produced or what their offspring have produced. And so it's spread very, very quickly without the ability to evaluate what actually is being passed on and what's going on. And that's the big difference between a common ancestor that has those kind of numbers and a popular sire that within a very short five or you know, 10 year period of time has those numbers. So it's uh, overuse that causes decreased diversity through a population bottleneck that all of a sudden goes through him and the, and the founder's effect. But the most insidious effect of the popular sire syndrome is that there's only so many quality bitches that are going to be bred with each generation. And if a popular sire is being brought to, to a high number of quality bitches, you are sidelining other quality males that represent the, the breadth and diversity of your gene pool that should be contributing to that population. So the overuse of individual breeding males excludes or reduces the influence of other quality males, thus narrowing the gene pool. And that's the insidious effect of the popular sire syndrome. So, so that's the biggest issue with genetic diversity that I see in dog breeds. So my mantra is that genetic diversity equals breeder diversity. It is the varied opinion of breeders as to what constitutes the ideal dog and their selection of breeding stock that maintains breed diversity. If uh, some people like a certain line and some people like another certain line or a certain look, um, if uh, some people want to line breed, some people want to outbreed, some people want to do whatever, as long as everyone's doing something a little different, that's what allows genetic diversity to breed. It cannot be regulated. It cannot be legislated. Okay, you have to do this kind of breeding and you've got to do this breeding and the next generation you'll get to do the other stuff if you want to. You know, it, you can't do that. But it, it, it's just having everyone do something a little bit different instead of all running to just one corner of the gene pool that allows us our genetic diversity. So managing genetic diversity in small population breeds is the last slide of this, of this uh, portion here. You want to avoid the popular SAR syndrome you want to utilize quality dogs from the breadth of your population to expand the gene pool. And the expansion of the gene pool is important. I, I am a little concerned that your numbers continue to drop. And I understand that those not, and the thing is, yeah, I shouldn't get into it, the case is crazy that numbers are dropping. It's tough breeding dogs. And people drop out, and, and people that are as dedicated as our generation was to breeding dogs, or is to breeding dogs, the younger generations, and I see some younger people here, and, and I, I'm, I'm pleased that you're here, but, but, you know, they have a lot of different options and things for them to be doing, you know, than breeding dogs, and, and to have the dedication that, that, that some of the older generations had to grow and maintain these breeds, may not be there as much. So, so there's really a cultural effect for the dropping in numbers. It's not, it's, you know, I, I think if you look at the numbers that the puppy mills are producing, and I don't think we're seeing a lot of percentages, you know, coming through commercial breeding anyway, but, but, you know, everybody's numbers are dropping to some extent because it's tough to breed, all right? But, but what's important as a geneticist is that we don't fall too far, that we maintain enough of a population that we don't lose genes just because we're not doing as much breeding as before and maybe losing good stuff that, that we should be maintaining. Monitor genetic health issues through regular health surveys. And I'm going to be hitting on that in the second half because that's something that your breed definitely needs to do. You know, not just address the major issues which you have been doing, but monitoring what's going on so that you know what's going on from generation to generation. Uh, do genetic testing for breed-related disorders and participate in open health registries to manage genetic disorders. And we'll be addressing those things in the next half. So um, I thank you for your attention during this half. If we have a couple of questions, I'll take them, and then we're going to take, uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break for developing a healthy breeding program. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions? Well, going to shoot you for this. Could we have done a better job when we brought the Africans back by keeping those lines more distinctive for more generations before they were mixed with the 
masses of American dogs. No, no, that would have been the wrong thing to do. Really? Yes. I mean, it, it would have been. It would have been good to to to, to add, especially if you don't have genetic tests and, and you don't know what they're carrying to kind of you know see what they're producing for a few generations. I'm sure you did that, but the bottom line is you need to integrate them and you need to integrate them rapidly. Could so have done both though, kept certain ones very separate and then allowed some. You could have, and maybe you, maybe yes. some did and maybe some yes. didn't. But yes. but it is the right thing. I, I mean, yes. the you know you talk about the Dalmatians with the uric acid where they bred to one pointer. And um, to bring in the normal gene, and they have the line, this line of dogs that have normal uric, uric acid levels, and, and don't have that gene for for, for bladder stones and and, uh, and uric acid, and and over 30 years, they still only had like six to ten dogs to to work with. You know, you can't integrate new genes into a breed. If you're only keeping two or three a generation, and you're only breeding them once or twice, so so if you kept them separate, then it's a fun thing, but you haven't helped your breed. You helped your breed by incorporating them and introducing them. Now, you, what you did, what you didn't want to do, and I don't know if it occurred or it didn't occur, is you didn't want them to become popular sires where everybody bred to them all at once. Okay, um, but uh, so. But based on what I'm looking at in your pedigrees, it looks like you guys did a good job. You know, I'm not looking at found, and I didn't look at a ton of pedigrees, but I looked at a lot more pedigrees than just those seven that I that I drew up there. Uh, I mean, I looked at a ton of your pedigrees, and and it's not like I saw um, after multiple generations that you had certain founders at 80%. You know, that that you were totally fixating on on a certain founder, or whatever. It looked like you were really incorporating them. And, and trying to incorporate them more uniformly than, than, uh, than totally fixating on them as, as single lines. Any other comments or questions? Oh, yes. Is there a standard math formula for the uh, generation percentage of uh, Well, the formula for the inbreeding coefficient is a, is a rights coefficient, was, was developed in, I think, the 19. It was the early part of the, of, of the 1900s, and the late Shimshu coffee. There are formulas um, for averages. I've probably done more analysis, these types of analysis of breeds, than anybody um, to, to tell you that most breeds, 10 generations, the average is going to be somewhere in the teens. Um, but, but there's not much published that, on that in that regard. <coughs> Um, the bottleneck is going to be due to breeding and not due to DNA. No, no, I understand. But, but, yeah, but having that DNA collection. a repository, which I'll talk about in the next half, okay. is extremely important. And you guys are so far ahead of the, the curve with the, with the DNA bank that Dr. Johnson has collected for you. And, and he did it surreptitiously because everyone was testing for Franconi. Right. And, he took, and he took it and turned it into a repository for you. So, so uh, you know, so thank him that uh, that he did that for you. And you have an amazing repository to work with for anything else that, that can come up. You you want to research um, uh, uh, you know some of the disorders that you don't know the genetics of your small animal, uh, your your small intestinal uh, um, um, disease, the chronic diarrhea syndrome, those things that are not going to be simple one gene. Gene disorders. You have the DNA, and all you need is is the is the health background, which he has collected in that genome project for you, uh, to be able to do that. You got another breed that has, you know, that has uh, inflammatory bowel disease or, or uh, um, something like that, and they finally say, and they finally collect the money, and they finally say, we want to address it, we want to look at it, and now we will start saving DNA. You know, it's going to take decades to select the kind of DNA that, to get you know what you already have to be able to give you answers. So so those having that repository is huge for your reading. Okay, let's take 10 minutes and we'll uh, reconvene at 3 o'clock.